soon and very soon we are going to see the king soon and very soon we are going to see the king soon welcome and very to soon. televisit with the bible we are presented going by to churches of christ in the show hallelujah hallelujah we're going to see the king welcome to televisit with the bible i'm ricky Collum. I'm privileged to be the preacher here at Cherokee Church of Christ, and today I'm going to get to show you my home congregation. I'd like to talk to you today. I'm one of the few preachers that has the opportunity to preach at his home congregation where I was raised. I went to school not very far from here, and when I was in school, my teachers, my English teachers, worked real hard trying to get me to understand the English language. As you can tell from my accent, I had problems with that. So I watched a program on television that came on on Saturday mornings called Conjunction Junction. It was the Schoolhouse of Rock. And I learned a little bit about conjunctions there. And when we're reading in our Bible, sometimes we don't look at the conjunctions. Recently, when I preached this sermon here at this church, a lady said, conjunctions add two parts together equally. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, a verse that we quote very often says, We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Notice that and there. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. I know we all struggle with sin. We all have problems with sin. But how many times in life do we fall short? Are you impatient? Do you have problems with your patience? That means that you fall short in patience. Do you have trouble for, with forgiveness? Do you struggle forgiving people? Then you fall short in forgiveness. Do you see how this adds to our duties as Christians? Let me ask you, do you have trouble with hatred? If you have trouble with hatred, then you fall short on love. You know, God is our standard for love. And God is love. Let's talk more about God's love inside. Through these doors, I learned about love. In these pews, I learned about God's love for me. If we're going to talk about love, we're going to have to talk about the standard of love, and that is God's love for us. One thing that I'm sure that we can all agree on is that everyone is looking for love. I hate to sound like a country song, but most people are looking in the wrong places. If you search the word love on your computer, you'll find that at least 32,500 books currently in print with the word love in the title. There's over 145,000 that deal with just the subject of love. There are more than 11,000 popular albums or CDs with love in the title. A, a recent search of the internet revealed that at least 121 million websites use the word love in their title. The theme of the Bible is a love story. It is a love letter from God to us. The word of, in one form or another, love, is found 419 times in God's word. In 1 John chapter 4, Verse 7 through 11, we read, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. These verses show that God has demonstrated, made manifest, his love for us through His Son. You know, love is found throughout the Bible, but First John carries love as its theme. I can remember 
When I was a child sitting in these pews, we had to do memory verses. And I always liked doing John three sixteen for God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish or should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, one time I went to the wrong book. I went to 1 John 3, 16. And in that verse, it tells us even more of the love that God has for us. 1 John 3, 16 says this, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. When you see God's love for us, do you feel that you fail or fall short in your love for your fellow man. One way that we fall short is the way that we look at love. We look at love like it's this mushy, emotional thing. Oh, Daddy, I love him so much. That's not the love that we're talking about in the Bible. The love is more than just a feeling. It's more than just an emotion. It is, it is something we feel, but it's more often something that we do. Love requires action. It is demonstrated through your behavior. It is sacrifice. Think about how many times your mother or your father sacrificed so that you could have something. How many times as a parent you have sacrificed so that your children could have something. That is love. Love is an action more than an emotion. God's love is more than just talk. He demonstrates compassion. He demonstrates love and compassion so that we can learn love and compassion. The writer Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 24, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. You see, we have to be a love in action because God is a love in action. Later in the Bible, John wrote in 1 John 3, 18, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. God demonstrates his love toward us through gift giving. You know, many times when we go on trips or we take vacations, we bring back a little token, a little something to our friends so that they will know that we thought about them on this trip. We take pleasure in giving presents to our children during the holidays. We celebrate celebrations or graduations and weddings and births with gift giving. But sometimes we overdo that, don't we? There's children today who think that they're not loved if they don't receive a gift. You see, it's more than gift giving. But we learn that from God. God also uses this aspect of love to express his sentiments to man. He gave gifts unto men. Ephesians 4 and 8 tells us that. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now God's love's not limited like our love. God even loves his enemies. He tells us to do it. I know it's hard to do, but he tells us to do it, but he does it through example. If you look in the book of Psalms, you can see in Psalm 145 verse 9, it says this, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his work. You see, God gives us sunshine and rain. He gives us fruitful seasons. And he gives us these beautiful, beautiful views. But he doesn't just give it to those who choose to follow him. He gives it to his enemies. He lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust just the same. We need to understand that God demonstrates his love on everyone. It falls on the lost as well as it falls on the saved. God demonstrates his love for us through the life of his son. Jesus helps us to get to know the love of God better. 
You know, love in various forms is found in the words of Jesus 86 times. But if you add compassion, which is a form of love to that, the number comes up to an even hundred. But I want you to really think about these verses. You see, Jesus told Philip in John 14, 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. We saw Jesus demonstrate his love in feeding the hungry people in John chapter 6. He healed the hurting people in Matthew chapter 4 verse 24. He directed the lost people in Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 and 36. He corrected the wrong people in the book of Matthew the 23rd chapter. Accepted rejected people in Luke 19 1 through 10. And we all know that he died for the lost, you and me, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. You know, there was a story told to me one time about a man in the pit. There was a man that had fell into a pit while traveling. Much like you think about Joseph being in the pit, his brothers putting him in it. It's, It's that type thing. The man's in the pit. But what I want us to think about is How would you react to that? Would you be a caring person? Would you say, I feel for you down in that pit, but not do anything? Would you be a smart person and say, you know, it's logical. That pit was there. Somebody was bound to fall into it, but still not help. Would you be a judgmental person and say, well, you know, Bad things happens to bad people, so only bad people would ever fall into that pit. Or would you be a curious person and leave him there, but ask him, how did you fall into that pit? Would you be a person who would say, well, my pit's deeper than your pit. My pit is so much worse than yours. Or would you be the type of person that would say something like, you know, if you just relax in your pit, that pit will become your home. Would you be an optimist and say, cheer up. That's a great pit that you're in. Or would you be a pessimist and say, you need to prepare yourself because it's just going to get worse. If we follow the example of Jesus and we see someone that falls into the pitfalls of life, we will love them, and we will lift them out of their pit. You know, we sing the song, and we need to truly sing it. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, when love lifted me. You see, God is love, and if Jesus is God, then Jesus is love. God demonstrates his love for us through the death of his son. You know, God has an infallible track record in all things, but especially when it comes to his love for us. He can be trusted. He, can, he has been proven time and time again. He is without question that he loves us. In Romans, the fifth chapter in the eighth verse, it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another story that comes to mind is the story of John Griffith. John Griffith was a man who lost it all in the Depression. He was a rich man before the Depression, but the the market falling took it all away from him. And he had to take a job running a drawbridge in Mississippi what we would call minimum wage, just hardly nothing, just enough to survive. One day he brought his son to work with him. And during the day, John forgot about his son. Uh, He got busy doing the things in life. and, And about that time he heard the sound of the whistle of the Memphis Express. It was coming and this wasn't a regular train. This was a passenger train and there were about 400 people on board. And he looked and he had just let the bridge up so that a boat could come through on the Mississippi 
And the bridge was up and, and those 400 people were headed to their doom. And John reached to grab the lever to lower the bridge when he noticed that his son was stuck in the gears. He had been climbing up there. He didn't know. This was his first day at work. He didn't know exactly how it worked and he was curious. John had a dilemma, didn't he? If he lowered that bridge, it was going to cost him the life of his son. But if he left the bridge up, 400 people were going to die that day. John made a decision that he'd think of for the rest of his life. He made a decision that he's going to dream a thousand times when he pressed the lever to lower the bridge for the people on the Memphis Express to live. He's going to see in those dreams the windows going by his building there and the people's expression. Some of them happy, but most of them not even noticing. Most of them don't even know that just a few seconds before they could have been the ones who died that day. You know, we're like that, aren't we? Jesus Christ came to this earth to walk as a man and die for our sins. But we don't notice. We go about our business on Sunday. We play our round of golf. We go fishing. We watch the ball game as if nobody died for us. But Jesus Christ died for us. God gave his only son. And the only difference is that John Griffin didn't know that the train was coming. But God knew. God knew. He had this plan from the beginning. He knew that his son was going to have to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. You see, God had a plan. God had a plan from the beginning that he was going to send his son to this earth. But he knew that he could not save sinners and Jesus at the same time. Just like John Griffith had to make a decision between his own son and those passengers on the Memphis Express, God knew from the beginning that his son was going to sacrifice his life for us. You can read in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. History will tell you that Jesus' death was the cause of angry Jews or the Roman occupation, but it was not that. It was a plan of God from the beginning so that you and I could have salvation. John says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the world is looking for love and God is love. So really the world is looking for God. I hope that you would make a decision today to follow and obey God's will. Televisit with the Bible, presented by Churches of Christ in the Shows. Join us again next week at the same time for Televisit with the Bible. Welcome to Televisit with the Bible, presented by Churches of Christ in the Show. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Welcome.
to Televisit with the Bible. I'm Ricky Collum. I'm privileged to be the preacher here at Cherokee Church of Christ. And today I'm going to get to show you my home congregation. I'd like to talk to you today. I'm one of the few preachers that has the opportunity to preach at his home congregation where I was raised. I went to school not very far from here. And when I was in school, my teachers, my English teachers, worked real hard trying to get me to understand the English language. As you can tell from my accent, I had problems with that. So I watched a program on television that came on on Saturday mornings called Conjunction Junction. It was the Schoolhouse of Rock. And I learned a little bit about conjunctions there. And when we're reading in our Bible, sometimes we don't look at the conjunctions. Recently, when I preached this sermon here at this church, a lady said, conjunctions add two parts together equally. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, a verse that we quote very often says, We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Notice that and there. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. I know we all struggle with sin. We all have problems with sin. But how many times in life do we fall short? Are you impatient? Do you have problems with your patience? That means that you fall short in patience. Do you have trouble for, with forgiveness? Do you struggle forgiving people? Then you fall short in forgiveness. Do you see how this adds to 